Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Brian Bauer. Dr. Bauer is an expert on the ancient civilizations of the Andes, and in particular, the Inca Empire and their predecessors, the Wari. Our conversation is focused on the Wari, an enigmatic civilization that laid the groundwork for imperial expansion in the region. We learned about Dr. Bauer's work excavating at Espiritu Pampa, a Wari colony on the frontier of the Amazon basin. We discussed topics like death and burial, hierarchy and social inequality, and how the Wari influenced the later Inca Empire. With all that said, my name is Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. Dr. Bauer, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to do this with you. I wanted to open with a quote that you share in your book. So the quote is, Traveling through the central Andes, in the late 1540s, the Spanish foot soldier Pedro Cieza de Leon stopped to ponder the ruins of an ancient city. De Leon surmised that the city, based on its ruinous remains and unusual architecture, was constructed long before the Inca came to power. We now call the ancient city Huari, and the territory over which it once ruled, the Huari Empire. I think it's safe to say that most people, even if they don't like history all that much, have heard of the Inca and have at least a vague image of what that culture and way of life looked like. But I have a suspicion that even most history buffs, at least the ones in the U.S., haven't heard of the Wari and probably don't know anything about them or who they are. The first question I had for you was, why do you think they're so much less well-known? The Wari are interesting in the fact and I was trying to think about this, is that I think they may have been the most recent ancient state discovered. Mm -hmm. You think that we know all the ancient states that existed, they would be obvious that we've known it for forever. They're Mm -hmm. just out there and we know that they existed. But it wasn't until the 1960s and 70s, were archaeologists able to sort out the archaeological evidence they see in the central Andes Mm -hmm. and realize that there were, in fact, at least two large states in the highlands of Peru and Bolivia that Mm -hmm. existed side by side. And one of them we now call the Mm Wari. They were located near Ayacucho in Peru. And the other is the Tiwanaku, yeah. which are located in Bolivia. And they shared a common religion, or at least a common religious iconography. So you're right, I don't think many people know of the, the Wari. This, this book that you've written on the Wari, it's a little bit of a departure from uh, a lot of your career as a researcher studying the Inca. So what prompted this, this book? Well, that's, that's correct. I generally specialized working in Cusco, which of course is the capital of the Inca Empire. Mm -hmm. And most people know Cusco because it's the entrance to to Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was working at the last Inca capital. When the Spanish arrived, the Inca nobility retreated into a very remote area of the Andes, slightly in towards the jungle. And they set up a last stronghold. And that Mm -hmm. stronghold is called Vilcabamba. So as an Inca specialist, I was working at the site of Vilcabamba. Mm -hmm. But in that same area, uh, a colleague of mine named Javier Fonseca Santa Cruz, who is a co-author on this work, Mm -hmm. he was there as well working at this newly discovered site, the site of Espiritu Pampa. And so because we're working probably less than a kilometer, half a mile from each other, Mm -hmm. uh, we visited each other's sites. I was working on the Inca. He was working on on the Wari. And we got to know each other. And in the end, we decided uh, it would be great. In fact, we combined his work on the Inca with my work on the Inca, and we produced a book about that, and then mm-hmm. we combined our efforts to look at the Wari. So it was just a lucky circumstance that I was near the site when it was discovered and have followed up with this uh, co-authored book about uh, the Wari enclave mm-hmm. in Espiritu Pampa. You know, there's a funny sort of symmetry to the way that uh, the Spanish Empire moved into the structures and the 
administrative imperial systems in the New World in, in, in the way that they installed themselves at the top of the Aztec Empire, at the top of the Inca Empire. But then uh, the Inca, for instance, weren't stepping into an imperial vacuum either. They were also installing themselves on the template that the Wari had created, right? Yeah, I think that happens so often in uh, imperial growth. Yeah. Uh, when empires grow, they don't enter into vast lands of emptiness or yeah. unorganized yeah. people. The easiest thing is that if you're moving in, what you generally do is you remove the top elite mm -hmm. and you install your own people. Mm -hmm. And then for a long time, you use the precondition organization of the region. So the Spanish made use of the Inca organization of the empire. In fact, many departments and states now reflect Inca division. So the yeah, Spanish come yeah. in, they take over, they remove the top people, but they keep some of the administration the same. For the Wari, on the other hand, though, there seems to be much more of a, uh, a trailblazing element right. in the imperial sense. That's right. It's a first state. It's a first generation state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in many places, you will have kind of state after state, empire comes in, and there's yeah. a rising and falling of complex societies through time. Yeah, the, sort of the analogy I was thinking of, or the comparison, was um, how the Akkadian Empire was sort of a template state, and then the Assyrians, like if you map the Assyrian Empire, it looks a whole lot like the Akkadian Empire with a new name. And then if you map the Babylonian and the Persian empires, they look like the Assyrian Empire with a new name, and then the Macedonian Empire. They keep supplanting each other within the same imperial space. And that happens, let's say, with the Spaniards, maybe with the Incas. But until the Wari, let's say 600 AD, maybe 650, mm -hmm. there had never been a political organization large enough in the central Andes to control a large area. Mm -hmm. And in that way, the expansion of primary states is different than expansion of later states because they're really moving into areas that have lower level political development. Yeah. And so I think their expansion is, is maybe quicker mm -hmm. and maybe a little unchecked because they're the first large-scale power to emerge, right. and they're able right. to expand quickly. And I, th this, I guess, will kind of lead into um, Espiritu Pampa as a site, but but it definitely seems like the, the Wari expansion in large part was along the Andes as opposed to out from the Andes. Is that is that fair as well? Well, let's say it's out from the highlands. It, uh, they're mm -hmm. not located mm -hmm. in the Amazon basin. Mm -hmm. There were large political organizations on the coast, mm -hmm. but those are separate. In Peru, really what's going on on the coast and what's going on in the highlands, they're very, very different worlds. Uh -huh. But the Wari develop in Ayacucho which is, I don't know exactly, I can't remember, maybe 2,300 meters. Wow. Uh, they, they expand out, and they probably expand along the Andean areas, but also one of their first expansive moves is to go from the highlands down to the coast, and they go into the Nazca region, which mm, is famous yeah. for its Nazca lines. But you see very early on in Wari development a mixture of coastal pottery types and colors, mm -hmm. and, and it's a little bit in question, was Nazca going up or was Wari going down? But there's some interaction very early, and then they, and then they expand. And, and a lot of the infrastructure, the sort of the patterns of empire that the Inca utilized, the road building that they're so famous for, this is also, right, a sort of a first, first developed by the Wari. Probably. That's a big question among academics because you have uh, the Wari begin to expand around 600, 650, and then they come to quite a distinct collapse around 1,000 to 1,100. Hmm. Interestingly, Tiwanaku has about that same trajectory. Uh, also a collapse at that time. Yeah. Interesting. And, and so 
like who expands first, who collapses last, what's the nature of their interaction is, is being debated across different areas. But what you have is the collapse of the warrior between 1,000 and 1,100. Mm -hmm. And the Incas begin to expand at about 1400 AD. So you have a time gap of 300 years between the collapse of the Wari and the expansion of the Inca. Hmm. So there's a roads, no doubt the Incas used uh, Wari roads to expand, but the Wari would have used earlier people's roads to yeah. expand. Yeah. But like ideas about state infrastructure, how do you organize a, a society? Mm -hmm. We know a lot about the Incas and how much can that be projected back? And it's hard to know uh, how much the Incas are influenced by the Wari mm -hmm. or how much is simply this is how states expand. Right. And, and sometimes we can get carried away and forget that a parallel might be there just because it's the natural way for something to be done. Like... Um, like how societies across the world built pyramids, but not because of some secret super culture, but just because that's an effective way to build tall monuments with simple technology. Exactly. <laughs> you can look at Cahokia in yeah. southern Illinois in the U.S. You can go to Mexico, you can go to the Maya, and you can go across South America and say that's not because there was some kind of uh, aesthetic traveling through. It's yeah. just that's one of the ways that humans build monumentality. Yeah, yeah. So what is special about Espiritu Pampa? Because that seems to be one of the kind of the key points of this book is that it's a very unique site for the Wari. Yeah, it, it's very unique. I was very, very lucky to be kind of in the right place at the, at the right time. Before we started working at Espiritu Pampa, there were people who said, who suspected that the Wari up in the highlands had some contact with the, the Andean slope. Mm -hmm. So this is, Spiritu Pump is about a thousand meters high, and it's in a, an area of, let's say, co a coffee growing now. Mm -hmm. And people thought that the Wari, surely the, the Wari would have been interested in some of the resources, exotic bird feathers, wood, maybe uh, honey, silver. Right. You'd think there'd be a whole trove of things. It's a very different ecological niche. Yeah. So it was thought there was some contact, but I don't think few people thought that there would be a large-scale colony mm -hmm. in at this distance from the Wari capital and at this altitude. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of my work. I, I tried to figure out, we have this big Wari occupation at Espiritu Pampa. Mm -hmm. Was that an isolated colony, which was physically separated from the capital? Or was it like an, uh, a territorial, was it a settlement on the edge of the Wari Empire? Right, And yeah. so uh, through our work, one of my contributions is I think we're able to show that this was, in fact, I call it an enclave, we just call it a colony, and that there, the Wari sent people out into this semi-jungle area, and they established a new Wari city there. Yeah. And before we found it, Nobody really suspected that the Wari would have invested in this area as much as they did. Is it, is it known what sort of, um, to what degree this was sort of a, um, an elite hierarchical state, one that had the equivalent of like an aristocracy or like a ruling class? And uh, do, we, do we know what the sort of social order of the Wari might have looked like? We have an idea. In fact, we found a very elaborate burial there. What I would call a regional governor or... Is the, this um, the, the Lord of... Uh, Vilcabamba. Vilcabamba. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been named the, the Lord of Vilcabamba. And so he was a, a regional governor or a governor of this uh, enclave, I would mm -hmm. guess. But we know at the 
capital city of Wari, there are immense mausoleums, mm -hmm. multi-story, and they oh, go wow. way down into the ground. Wonderful stonework. So there's no doubt that those were like the tombs of the highest echelons yeah, of yeah. the state. Mm -hmm. And so with Espiritu Pampa, we begin to see not only is the capital having uh, multi-levels, but the capital is sending out high-ranking people to rule under their guidance in mm -hmm. more remote areas. And it was exciting to work at Espiritu Pampa because all the, let's call them kings, all the king burials are looted in Wari. And this oh, was- Oh, interesting. And yeah. this, this is the, it's a regional governor, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. it's the highest Wari individual who has been found. Although oh, we wow. know yeah. there were so, kings and queens and others. I mean, you presume that is the result of looting, maybe from the capital itself, but there's no provenance. You don't know where it's coming from. But yeah. here we find an intact burial representing a very high level, not the top, but fairly high up, who would have had considerable power, prestige, and wealth among, among the warriors. What would have been the the value to the worry of this this colony? What what sort of resources are they are they getting out of it? Is it about probably those sorts of valuable trade goods that are coming from this different environment? Unfortunately, a lot of the trade goods that they would have been interested in, let's think about maybe exotic bird feathers. Mm -hmm. um, bird feathers were, you know, for costumes and and for weaving, very mm -hmm. very high uh, high valued items or coca leaves would have been very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. um, those don't preserve well yeah. in the archeological record, especially yeah. this is an area that has very, very heavy rains. In fact, mm -hmm. when we dug the, the burials, some of them had no bones left whatsoever. A few had the tiny remains of, of teeth. This is an area which was well known for gold and silver. So I'm sure that they were interested in that. Maybe it came in, but through the excavations, we don't see any evidence of large scale mining occurring at the site. Mm -hmm. In sites that we know were used for prehistoric mining, you get large grinding stones. You get the ore and you have to process it or you have to smelt it. And that requires very specific technology yeah, that you yeah. can usually pick up. And we don't see any of that. <laughs> maybe the mines were someplace else. Maybe the smelting was someplace else. We know that the Incas were interested in the gold and silver of this area. And then, of course, the Spaniards heard about that and was very yeah, interested yeah. in that. And in fact, there is very small level gold and silver mining continue today. So I think it wasn't the reason, but it's one of, one of many resources. A lot of the resources would have been unique to the jungle that the Highlanders didn't have access to. And so yeah. they sent out what I, I would suggest, they actually sent out a colony and the colony was established in a, a, a remote area, but it lasted for maybe 300 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spiritu Pampa was occupied. Uh, the, the, gate, the dates are great. They start around the mid 650 hmm. AD, and then they go right up to 900 or 1,000 and stop. Wow. So it, the dates we have for Spiritu Pampa really match up exactly with the time we, we know the worry was expanding. And, and what is it actually, the site, what does it look like? Like if I were to stand, say, on top of the main site datum, uh, what, what would I see? So if you stand near it, you don't see anything on the surface. But now that it's been excavated, there are no, uh, like, mounds. So the very center of the site is a small plaza, mm -hmm. and then around it are what Wari specialists call D-shaped structures. So they're D-shaped structures. D-shaped, yeah. like the letter. So you would go in the straight side of the D, and you'd be facing kind of a crescent-shaped building. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, or or half half circular penalty. Yeah. Yeah. And there are in fact four of those. Not quite a line, but there are four of those off the plaza, and huh. it's the position of those four D-shaped structures that define the plaza. Mm-hmm. And through research that's gone on for maybe the last 15, 20 years, people have begun to realize that these D-shaped structures were really unique buildings for the worry, and mm. they represent some type of, let's call them temple, mm. that they're at the center, and they're usually filled with uh, ritual offerings. Some have evidence of trophy heads, but these are not normal houses, and underneath them, I think a total of of 40 burials. Wow. um, Many of which contained um, very elaborate metal working. Mm -hmm. So as a whole, uh, Spiritu Pampa has the largest collection of bronze, largest collection of silver objects from any worry site ever wow. ever found so it's not just the lord of uh, vilcabamba who's who's elite but there's there's a whole collection of these that are quite quite elite burials yeah and i i write about that in, in one piece that not only do you have evidence of what we could gloss as a regional governor or the ruler of a colony you can see status differences going down from him and you don't just drop down to the peasant level. There are different levels of right, yeah. of status mm-hmm. reflected in the burials. And so I suggest that we see here in these burials evidence of almost a bureaucracy or certainly a hierarchy of status, yeah. which the apex is the Lord of Vilcabamba, who's mm-hmm. buried with this enormous pectoral. It's a Y-shaped pectoral it's it's really spectacular he has gold armbands he he has a couple ceremonial staffs wow uh, he has lots of silver bangles um, a lot of very impressive material but outside that burial there are a series of other burials which also contain high value objects which i would suggest represent kind of lower level officials yeah yeah and and so presumably this would be sort of the the colonist population. Is that something that's been looked into, sort of like the the either the genetic or isotopic data from these burials? Is there a sign of whether they've they've migrated to the area or or whether they're related to say other lower caste, lower class burials in the same area? That's that's a great question, and we tried to get at it, and it's tough mm-hmm. because. There are no skeletons. Right, right. It's, it's just the it, teeth in so many it, it's cases. Just, yeah. It's just tiny <laughs> bits of teeth, so you don't have that kind yeah, of genetic yeah. material. Well, uh, so then what about the ceramics? The ceramics are either imported from the Wari heartland or they imitate the Wari heartland. Hmm. So the aesthetics of the ceramics are Wari. Yeah, yeah. However, some of the largest utilitarian vessels found at the site mm-hmm. are distinctly not worry oh, and they reflect i see an aesthetic of the tribal organizations that continue in some of these areas today and so what we suggest is that the war in fact sent colonists down so you could imagine english colonists mm-hmm. leaving england coming over to the u.s setting up uh, some kind of uh, miniature or the the settlement they settle would look like a settlement the organization of the households yeah, it would the, be the, the layout the english template is, is using english aesthetics yeah. but at the same time they are going to be interacting with the local people mm-hmm. because in prehistory we can presume everything's occupied there, there are no empty spaces yeah it's not a wilderness that they're coming into an, an yeah. empty wilderness and so what we we try to argue is that the worry are these agriculturalists large populations expansive expansionistic empire in the highlands yeah they go down to these lowlands and who do they find it's probably a slash burn 
uh, society. Mm -hmm. Maybe hunter and gatherer, but I picture more slash burn. Mm -hmm. Probably a different language speakers. Yeah. yeah. But they're moving into an area which is already settled. The, the density is probably very light, but mm. they do develop some kind of trading relationship despite probably suspicion on both sides, despite the language yeah, some burials. degree of antagonism. Yeah. Nevertheless, they establish a colony and they begin to trade with the local people. And so we could see that in the U.S. on the East Coast, or you could switch it to maybe even a more familiar picture of Europeans expanding across the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They move into an area. Local people might be repelled in some ways, but also they're attracted yeah, because yeah. the new people have different things. Yeah, and metals. the new economic system yeah. sucks in and, people from the area. And yeah. so both sides are seeing advantage in some collaboration, some trade. And yeah, so yeah. I think the war people go down, and I think they move down in groups. It's not like just the men are going down. I picture right. it almost a, a uh, so yeah, the, the word colonization really would be apt in that case. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not like a conquest where the Spaniards spend just the men right. down. Right. But this is warry people going down and setting up a colony near the jungle mm -hmm. and then starting to trade with local people for the stuff that they can't produce. And the local people are willing to trade because... I would guess they're interested in the copper, mm -hmm. or, or yeah. it's actually bronze, but they're interested in the state-produced objects. Yeah, that yeah. just like axes, you know, the the warrior are bringing down pretty good bronze axes. If you're living in slash burn uh, lifestyle, that's got to be a very very attractive item. You know, that's something I think that a lot of even people who know much about history probably don't think about often is the the metalworking of the Andes. I think they probably imagine a lot of uh, just stone tool working. When you think about the Andes, you think about the Incas, and mm -hmm. you think about world-class stonework. Mm -hmm. But you also have in Peru spectacular metalwork. We have very few. You see museum exhibits, and they'll say gold of the Incas. They're really saying the gold of the Andes because, yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> most Inca gold was melted down by the Spaniards. So we ah, don't. Okay. So when you think about the Incas, you don't think about lots of gold work because the Spanish melted it all down because of the ransom of Atahualpa and and the conquest. Mm -hmm. But you do have these royal tombs from earlier civilizations yeah, yeah. that had, of course, gold and silver, but bronze as as yeah. well. And what what is the scale of Spiritu Pampa? Like, is there a sense of how big it might have been? How many people? What the extent of the site might be? We don't know. It would be nice to expand it out, mm -hmm. but the further you get from the center, if it's organized like most cities, most occupations, the further you go get out, the more perishable the, the material is. But you'd certainly find ceramics. Yeah. But yeah. there just hasn't been a project yet to define the outskirts of the, of the colony. And speaking as well of outskirts in this case, though, just sort of on the the state level of the worry. It, do you think the site is unique because it was unique then, or do you think it's unique because more along the Amazonian slope have yet to be found? I think it was pretty unusual, but uh -huh. not unique. Mm -hmm. I think now that we have found this site, we may find others, mm -hmm. but the distances between these, because they're colonies, the distances between the worry sites in this semi-jungle area mm -hmm. is going to be great. And it's a pretty rough area. Mm -hmm. The mountains are tough. There's jungle cover. There's, so, not, there's not much road. So It would have been a, a, a kind of a state expenditure, a pretty serious one. 
to establish a place like this. Yeah, it, it's a long ways. Yeah, and yeah. so they were there for a specific reason. And remember, this is the area we call Vilcabamba. I was there because it represents the last capital of the Inca Empire. It's in the same valley as the Spiritu Pampa, very close. And so the Incas retreated there because it was so remote. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get far away from the Spaniards in basically an impenetrable area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, it's not quite impenetrable, <laughs> but it's a, it, it's a couple long days of, <laughs> of travel to, to get out there. And so earlier in prehistory, it would have been more and yeah. more remote. It would be a long slog to get out there if you're going yeah. along trails. Yeah, what is that? What was that experience like of, of getting out there? When I worked there, and it was only 10, 15 years ago, it, it was very a special experience because then... The roads didn't go all the way out there. I know people who've worked out there much earlier, and it was much more difficult, but we could, in two days, get within four hours of the site, and that would be the end of the road. And then you're trekking? Yeah. You would go to the end of the road, and you could only get there once a week. Yeah. So you get to the end of the road, and then you'd have a four-hour hike up to the, up to the site. And so there was no electricity, no running water. So it was special in that we lev lived in that condition. The people were, were lovely, but also it was a sense that this was, it was the end of an era. Hmm. And last time I visited the site, which was last year, we drove a Jeep and we arrived right at the site. Wow, that's a big uh, change. Which is, wow. you know, for the local people, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's, awesome. that's great. Yeah. They can get their produce in and out. They don't have to rely on a, uh, a, a weekly fare. Mm -hmm. But even some of the older people there, they're a little bit nostalgic. And they say, yeah, the character of the village has, has changed. They now have lights, which is a good thing, and they have <laughs> some water and, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, radios. There, there's even some internet. But to be there at the at the last decade uh, of an era. Uh, going forward, do you have further questions about the Wari? Do you plan to turn back towards the Inca more, or? I'm working with some of the metal. From, this, from, this from Spiritu Pampa. Spiritu Pampa. I'm yeah. doing two things. I'm starting, we've written up the material from a Spiritu Pampa, and I'm starting to compare it to finds in other Wari sites. Mm -hmm. I'm starting, I'm looking more in museum collections for, for evidence of, let's say, other sites that may have had regional lords, but that was looted. Mm -hmm. and, but now we know what to look for. Yeah. I can go through museum collections and say, oh. ooh, this looks suspiciously like this might represent an equal status person that we have in Spiritu Pampa. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm looking at that, and I'm also returning to work in Cusco on Inca sites. There are site reports yeah. in various ministries talking about what was found in a highway expansion project or when a suburb was built. Yeah. There are all these evidence of rescue projects but they're written in reports and shelved away in the gray literature in the gray literature yeah yeah in and and it's not going to last because <laughs> yeah you, you just have a broken roof or a flood yeah it's in the one sort of published copy with like spiral bound exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it you've got some final report of the rescue from the construction of a hospital and yeah. they happen to have found some really interesting remains why should i excavate new sites when yeah, you have yeah. these really important finds that won't last because yeah, they'll disappear at some point yeah yeah, yeah that, that that even though we think they're written up they're going to get old they're going to get tossed out and that's where my energy should be now because that material is already found. I can give a greater context and permanency to it. I mean, in, in my personal experience, that's, that's, I think, the kind of work that there needs to be a lot more of. I, I work a lot in Alaska, and mm -hmm. I was working on a... Essentially, what I wanted to do was 
compile all of the cave sites in the state and look at them as sort of a type and see what sort of patterns in the way people use caves were emerging. And uh, there were whole sections of the state where at first glance it looked like there simply were no cave sites. But there actually were, were detailed studies done by the Forest Service, by the Park Service, surveying caves specifically for archaeological sites. And the reason I couldn't find any of them is because they were all locked up in the gray literature. There was, you know, one paper copy and no digital copy. And we're, we're, we're losing it. Also, yeah, it's a race against time. What's also interesting is that, let's say there's a new highway built, and so there's a big rescue project. Mm -hmm. The scale of those rescue projects, contrast that with like an <laughs> uh, academic project. I might have a small field crew. We could go out and yeah, dig yeah. X number of two by twos and compare that with the database where somebody builds a 20 mile long highway yeah, through yeah, exactly. an area. It's, like it's coarse data. It's messy data sometimes. but And there's no way. There's no way I could get funding. In yeah, fact, pay enough the, people. Pay enough people. <laughs> if you find, I'm hoping if you find the right report mm -hmm. from the right rescue project, it can make a, a big impact. So that's where I focused in the last year. And I found some pretty good, good reports. So I want to try to get them into the public's eye. If people want to learn more about the worry, uh, and I guess in particular learn about, you know, say, some of the themes we've been talking about, burials, elites, are there any particular researchers or, or books that, in your mind, kind of stand out that they should search? I think the very best book right now on the worries, and uh, my apologies to all colleagues who have produced other books, <laughs> but I think one of the best is a catalog that was produced um, at the Art Institute of, of Cleveland. They had what has been the only large-scale exhibit of Wari art wow. uh, ever, I believe. And it was <laughs> maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But the catalog of that is Susan Berg's Wari, The Lords of the Ancient Andes. They have illustrations of all the wonderful pieces because they brought in pieces from Europe and the U.S. and South America. So it, it's really the, the most impressive artifacts related to the Wari. That's so useful, too, for a, a culture like this where, you know, something like ancient Rome, people have seen so many artistic depictions over the years. And some of them, like in movies, are going to be a little bit bastardized, a little warped. But, but even so, they have a they, they can conjure a picture pretty quickly. But for uh, for a more obscure uh, culture like the Wari, they're, they've got no foundation to start with in, in, in terms of imagination. And these, if a museum catalog is done right, they can become hallmarks in the knowledge of that society. I yeah, mean, this, yeah. this Cleveland production is separated almost from, from any, and, and it will be be a major publication in the study of Wari for the next 20 or 30 years. It's great because it has lots of wonderful objects of Wari, and they have Wari mm -hmm. featherworks and metalworking and ceramics. Then, of course, it's accompanied by a wonderful introduction that lays out the history of Wari research, and yeah, then, yeah. then there are a series of articles by all the the, the big name Wari specialists. So you mm -hmm. get lovely pictures, lovely image, essays about artistic traditions of the Wari, and then a lot of chapters that, that talk. So it also provides that introduction, which will be a, a great overview of the Wari. And uh, I suppose also, I'm not sure we've actually said the name of your book, uh, The Wari enclave of Espiritu Pampa like I did they could also find that online yeah. it was really readable I like it was not the sort of normal sea of jargon that you often find in a academic report or, or summary of something it, it, like it, it it was really fun to read um, okay great and, that's yeah. that, that's nice to know I, I try to make the writing um, accessible and people yeah. can also read the conclusion or mm -hmm. the or the introduction and that provides the overview and yeah, then the, and yeah. then they can weigh weigh into the more data laden 
uh, chapters if they if they want. Yeah. Well, with that said, uh, Dr. Bauer, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. This was uh, fun for me. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey everybody, if you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor, as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.